In this webcast, we're going to begin to learn about the relationship between stereochemistry and mechanism. And since mechanisms are governed by orbital interactions, we're going to see that there's a very close connection between the stereochemistry of a reaction and the orbital interactions that are involved. Let me introduce some words that describe the stereochemistry of reactions. We say that a reaction is stereospecific if the stereochemistry of the reactant completely determines the stereochemistry of the product, and there are no other options. In other words, the pathway of this reaction and the orbitals that are involved have a very specific interaction that governs the stereochemistry, and it can only be one way. Once we know the stereochemistry of the reactant, the reaction pathway immediately determines the stereochemistry of the product. That's different than a stereoselective reaction in which there's a choice of pathways that could follow, and each of the pathways will lead to different stereochemical outcomes. In general, one reaction pathway may be more favorable than the other, and so we don't always end up with equal mixtures of stereoisomers, but we might end up with a preference, a selectivity. That's why we use the word stereoselective reaction. So in the remainder of this webcast, we want to look at the substitution reactions that we've learned about and decide whether they're stereoselective or stereospecific, and if they are stereospecific, what kind of stereochemical outcome can we expect? Let's begin with the SN2 pathway. Here we see a thiolate nucleophile attacking the alkyl bromide. That alkyl bromide is the leaving group it leaves, and we have the SN2 substitution at this particular carbon. Let's take a close look at the stereochemistry. First, let's look at the product. Notice the position of the substituents that I'm highlighting in the product are exactly the way those same substituents are positioned in the reactant. However, take a look at the incoming nucleophile and the leaving group. And remembering that there's an implied hydrogen atom, if we think about where that must be, it's got to be a wedge in the product, and it must have been a dash in the reactant. So we can see that these two substituents, which I'll highlight in gold, have inverted their positions. When two substituents on a stereocenter change positions and two of them stay the same, we say that that's an inversion of configuration. And so, the configuration of the reactant will define the configuration of the product given that the reaction goes with inversion of configuration. And so, for that reason, we say that the SN2 reaction is a stereospecific reaction which goes by inversion of configuration. And now to understand this, let's take a look at the orbitals that are involved. We're going to examine this reaction. It's the substitution of the alkyl bromide bond with the nucleophile ammonia. So this is an N to sigma star sigma type interaction. And it's those orbital interactions which are going to govern the stereochemistry. The nucleophile must approach the alkyl bromide in a particular orientation in order to achieve that sigma type overlap. The orientation, the only one that works, is this orientation A. And you can see that the incoming nucleophile is positioned directly behind that carbon-bromine bond. So if we think about where sigma star is located, we can see the very large lobe behind carbon and nearly positioned directly into where that lone pair will be. If we make that translucent, we'll be able to see it better. And now let's look at that sp3 hybridized lone pair, which is clearly aligned in a sigma type orientation behind that carbon-bromine bond to achieve this sigma-type overlap. What's going to happen as this nucleophile comes in, there's going to be the bromine leaving, and at the same time, these hydrogens on the carbon, or whatever the substituents happen to be, are going to move over into the space, the region, where the bromine used to be. And it's for that reason, this orbital requirement, that the reaction goes with an inversion of configuration, and it's stereospecific. In great contrast to the SN2 reaction, the SN1 reaction does not proceed with stereospecificity. In fact, most SN1 reactions are not even stereoselective. They usually give a racemic mixture. The reason for that is because of this intermediate 
that is a planar carbocation. So following the dissociation of the nucleophile step, we make an achiral species, even if we started with one stereoisomer, say the R stereoisomer. This achiral species could then add, in the association of a nucleophile step, the incoming nucleophile from either of two sides. Here are the orbitals involved in this A sub N step. It's the non-bonding pair of electrons, sp3 hybridized, that's the nucleophile, attacking the empty atomic orbital on this electron deficient carbon of the carbocation. The tertiary butyl carbocation, as you can see from this J mole, is planar. And it should be very clear from this structure that the nucleophile could achieve the desired sigma type orbital overlap from the Z or the minus Z. If we look at the orbitals that are involved and we can see a perfect sigma type orbital overlap is achieved, but that same orbital overlap would be achieved whether the nucleophile approaches from the plus Z side or the minus Z side. It's for this reason that the SN1 reaction has no stereospecific requirement and only in rare cases does it exhibit any kind of stereoselectivity.